Welcome everyone to the Sean Academy uh, Faculty Development Roundtable on transforming your teaching into educational scholarship. Uh, this roundtable will be led by Dr. Karen Souter. She will give us a brief overview of transforming your teaching into educational scholarship. Then we will hear about two examples. One focused on classroom teaching um, offered by Dr. Michael Lee at the Dell Medical School and a clinical teaching example from Dr. Sauter. After that, we will have a brainstorming session followed by breakout groups, so it can be interactive, um, led by Dr. Luanne Wilkerson at Dell Medical School on how to develop a question. Dr. Zauder will lead us in a brief debriefing session at the end. This roundtable was suggested at the SHINE meeting in February. So many thanks to the Faculty Development Committee for helping to organize. Dorothy Sundelbach, Luanne Wilkerson, Kim Hoggett, and Gary Reed. And of course, many thanks for our support um, from Luanne Berger. So we have a very full agenda today. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Zauder. Many of you may know her. She is Assistant Dean in the Office of Educational Affairs at UTMB Health and a professor in the Department of Internal Medicine. She received her medical degree from Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine and did an internal medicine res residency at Francis Scott Key Medical Center. She did a gastroenterology fellowship at Cleveland Metropolitan General and a nutrition fellowship at St. Vincent Hospital. She is heavily involved in the Scholars in Education program at UTMB Health. And of course, she is a member of the China Academy. We are so pleased to have her involved in this session. So Dr. Sauter, please take it away. Okay, so thank you all very much. Um, this is a topic that I absolutely love talking about. Um, and so I will, I will be careful because I can get super carried away. I've got my clock up here in front of me to, to keep me on time. But we're gonna do a very brief overview of um, transforming teaching into scholarship. And I will tell you that there are several outstanding articles that have been written about this. Um, and if you dig around in the literature, um, it won't be hard to find something. There are a couple of great ones. If, if anybody wants references, I'll be happy to, um, to share those with you afterwards. Um, so let me just make sure, there we go. So where do we start? And we're gonna kind of try to get you to do some thinking and some framing in today. And so I would like you to start to think when we view ourselves as teachers or as educators, first of all, who is our audience? Um, because sometimes when people are talking about um, scholarly work from teaching, we get very fixated on a single um, group. And so when we're talking about this and, and later on when Dr. Wilkerson is sort of leading us in some brainstorming, think about all the levels where you might teach. So pre-professional, at the undergraduate level in whatever discipline you work in, at the graduate level, at the postgraduate level or at the faculty level or a little bit of everything. And then don't forget that we also serve as teachers both for our patients and in the community. And sometimes some really exciting educational scholarship comes out of those programs. So I'm gonna um, have my chat open or if you wanna unmute and speak, you're more than welcome to. But this is um, kind of a question of, so why do we wanna take what we're doing? Why do we wanna take our scholarship or take our work and transform it into scholarship? What are some of the reasons? Anybody? Validate our approaches and efficacy, great. Best practices, sure, sharing best practices. Increase, increase our own knowledge about effectiveness, absolutely. What else? So maybe you all just need um, some carbs. Um, 
yeah, so um, we're already doing the work. So it's really nice to get scholarship out of work that you're already doing. Um, the other thing is that um, both in sharing it, which many of us, many of you mentioned already, a chance to reflect on your own practices by turning it into a piece of scholarship, but also for many of us, it's the way we work through APT by having a career pathway as a um, clinician educator or a, 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 a science educator role. So I have um, this quote on my wall and I look at it every morning when I come in, it's Ansel Adams. who says, the only things in my life that com compatibly exist with this grand universe are the creative works of the human spirit. And I really feel like when I listen to the really cool stuff that other people are doing in education, um, I'm really transfixed. I find that so joyful and so stimulating. And so part of the reason we share this stuff is to motivate other people to do good things. However, if you're going to think, I want to use some of the stuff I'm already doing and I want to move it to educational scholarship, the foundation for educational scholarship is doing scholarly work. And there is no, um, there's no substitute for that. So when I frame scholarly work, I always go back to Glassic. I find this a very useful frame for me. And, and when I translate it into something that I'm preparing, and I've been all morning preparing for something I'm doing early this afternoon, um, I'm asking myself these questions. So what is my goal? What, what am I really trying to achieve with this activity? What have others done? So have I been in the literature? Have I pulled from best practices? Am I doing what I'm doing based on best practices? How can I approach this? And that includes me reflecting on what tools are accessible to me? What do I have available? Again, what I wanted to do this afternoon, I had to pivot because what I wanted to utilize wasn't accessible to me. How will I know if I'm meeting my objectives? And you need to think about that proactively. So what should I be observing or measuring or recording um, as a part of this activity I'm doing? How can I share what I'm doing? So who are my stakeholders and who is my interested community? And then finally, the thing that we do at the end of every um, activity is the sort of reflect, re refine, and repeat. So anytime you do something, then taking back and somebody mentioned reflection in the chat is to go back afterwards and say, was that the best way? What could I have done differently? Did I reach my target audience? Did I get my objectives across? Etc. So I, I find this a really helpful framework because when I do this consistently, then if I'm reflecting back three months later, I say, gosh, what have I done that's cool lately that I could talk about? I can go back and say, yeah, I set that up really well. It, it could turn into a piece of scholarship. So taking scholarly, scholarly work to educational scholarship basically is following what we call the three Ps. And, and there's been many sort of adaptations of this. This was published in 1999. Again, something that I used in my head. One, have you made your work public? And that's the dissemination piece. Has that work that you're sending out been peer reviewed? And is it being presented in a way that others can build on it? So is it an idea that can get other people stimulated, can get other people to build something that's adaptable to what they have. So you're not just trying to hand something to somebody, but you're saying, here's a core concept, here's an idea, here's a process, go for it. And let me know what you learn. So that's the dissemination piece. You want to take advantage of opportunities for dissemination whenever you can. The other thing is that when you're thinking about the changing your teaching or transforming your teaching into scholarship, as I was initially kind of trying to get you guys to frame, don't think only about the sort of classic undergraduate learner, if that's, you know, if you're teaching in a medical school or a school of nursing or a school of health professions, but think about the broader view, but also think about all the different ways to um, what you do as an educator. So what takes up your time? Where are you putting your energy? What's interesting to you? So if you're doing a learner assessment and, and you're like, okay, we did this whole big project to figure out what the needs assessment was for this and how we could best do this. Sometimes that needs assessment, it might not be a manuscript, 
but it might be enough for a sort of an appetizer piece of scholarship that you could get out, do a poster, talk to people about it at a meeting and have a little bit of feedback so you can continue to develop. So these are just some ideas and, and these categories for those of you that are familiar with the GEA um, uh, meeting that happened, oh gosh, so many years ago, they really framed sort of education and educational activities into these categories. And these are also helpful for me when I'm trying to get people to think beyond just in, in the act, actual activity of teaching. And so my final comment is, when you're thinking about transforming teaching into scholarship, take advantage when opportunity knocks. So, so do your homework, stay educated and, and be kind to others, share this as much as you can. Know what opportunities are open, know when special calls go open. And if you know someone who's doing something in that area, holler at them and say, hey, did you know MedEd Portal has a special call open right now for materials on X? You've been doing that. Maybe you could transform that into a piece of scholarly work. If you decide you're going to do that, create yourself a timeline. Um, be accountable. We just had this conversation again yesterday. You will get it done if you're accountable to somebody. And then finally, make appointments with yourself to get the work done. If you block time on your calendar, and even if it's an hour a week, this work will start to happen. If you just say, I'll fit it in, it's never, ever going to happen. So I'm going to stop with those sort of global concepts. We can come back and I'm going to introduce Dr. Lee. I'm going to stop my sharing and then let him take over. He was going to give us an example of taking classroom teaching into scholarship. So Dr. Lee. Absolutely. Thanks, Karen. Let me just pop this slide deck up there. Um, and it, it perfectly segues with your, your, your session here, which is um, really thinking about, I like to view the classroom as an experimental laboratory. Um, you know, I was trained as a basic scientist, so I wanna collect data on things. I wanna know if something works, something doesn't work. And I was not trained as an educational psychologist. I have no training in, in education, a, a teeny little bit, but not really very much. And so I learned as I moved along through the system over the years, on what needs to be done. What do I need to measure? And I think that the hardest part, right, is getting acquainted with the literature. And once I surmounted the literature, I said, okay, now I can come up with some interesting questions. And so hopefully that's what I'm going to paint here for you guys is uh, turning the classroom into a laboratory. Um, and I just, I'm going to take us through some data, but I don't want to, uh, this is not going to be a research talk. It's more to show my approach and how I was trying to, to, uh, basically figure out if this thing that I'm doing is working. So this is, uh, uh, and I'm at the Dell Medical School. That was what the picture was there. It was our uh, HLB building. So uh, right there in Austin. And uh, this is what our curriculum looks like. And the course that we're gonna be uh, looking at uh, real quick, the data and the sort of approach I was using uh, is this infections of disease course that's shown here. Uh, so in a nutshell, it's uh, all of infectious disease, microbiology and antimicrobial pharmacology Bam, right there, uh, which is, uh, if you're feeling stressed or up right now, um, imagine if you were taking the course. <laughs> so we try to do a lot and doing a flip approach. So that in and of itself is something really interesting to study. And so that that's the context right there, six weeks, flip approach, and then we zoom into the days of the week and what we're doing. And essentially what we have here is part of that day Monday, Wednesday, and Friday is taken up with what we call pillars, that's PBL. And then we have what we call uh, LGI or large group interactive. Sometimes it's lectures in some courses, it's mini lectures, sometimes it's cases. We're trying to use a flipped classroom approach. So we have students doing work ahead of time before they come to class. And then in class, we wanna have an application exercise where they apply that knowledge from the pre-work, right? Now, the rub here is that it's a largely voluntary curriculum. So they have to come to the PBL sessions, but the LGIs are purely voluntary. So we've got our active learning piece there in this voluntary segment. Maybe they do the pre-work, maybe they don't. So I just wanted to understand what's the recipe here for success? And is participation necessary to actually be successful in this component curriculum, these LGIs? And uh, I'm just looking in the chat here real quick. Yeah. 
And so um, just to kind of summarize and show you, I'm not going to go through every little nuance here, uh, but we've got pre-work, the classroom piece. Uh, we've got that PBL session I mentioned, and then our large group interactives. And this is over the course of the night before and the following day in class. And the, the salient scale down here is what I want to draw your attention to, which is we've got a lot of self-directed learning and then a little bit of faculty directed learning. So it really relies on this sort of handshake between these two that the students are gonna hold up their end of the bargain and do their work, come to class and participate in the things that we've set up for them uh, that we feel based on learning theory and experience this is gonna work this way. So that's the kind of handshake there, self-directed learning and then faculty directed learning. Okay, so before I show you the data, I wanna just, Reiterate what flip class, they watch a video, they listen to an, a, a podcast. Um, maybe they have some, maybe even some reading. Um, the more active it could be, and we can argue if a video is really active or not, they're getting the information. They bring that information to class and we engage in a game or a case. We do some kind of exercise where they're working in teams. So they've got to draw that information out of their brains and do something with it. And then we have an assessment later on. So I wanna know, are they gonna participate? Does that make a difference in their assessment? Right, because the objectives ahead of time, they don't know what's on the test, but they have a, a roadmap to it. They have the objectives for the pre-work and the in-class work. And so this question, uh, really looking at. And I have to back look at the, right, to really understand what are the moderators that classroom successful? What things have popped out from meta-analyses? Just a series of meta-analyses that are here, and you can exercise here. And I'm going to look at Luann, and hopefully she's going to be smiling, because when I talked to her about before, she asked the definition of the effect size for those that don't know. And what it is, it's the difference between means of studies. So it's this the mean of one study minus the mean of another, another divided by deviation. So you can get an attitude of change among studies. And so this effect size really kind of gives us a sense of this thing working. The higher the number, the more effective it is. And that's, I'm taking these here, but anyway, there's a, what I've learned from the literature is there's a number of moderators that pop out, to get some sense of how the thing works, the classroom technique, and what I need to do to be optimally or optimally successful. So that's the literature. And that was critical. And I needed to dig into these things and understand all the things that were being presented, even though some of them were way beyond my wheelhouse and my training as a basic scientist. So that was kind of step one. And so then I go, well, how am I going to do this study? And thinking about available and the thing I would always hear when I first started, well, you don't have a control group, right? You can't deprive part of the students of something and, and give the other something. And so there's a variety of ways to get around this. Um, our undergraduate colleagues that teach often have different sections and they can do a different intervention in different sections, which is really nice. We don't have that, excuse me, we don't have that luxury. Um, so I do a cohort. I look at different cohorts and I establish cohort equivalency amongst these groups of medical students. And then I'm able to build my in from there and kind of look at the overall effect uh, on this population of students. It's, it's a little bit less than 100, right? I looked at the cohorts found that they're equivalent in terms of the works that I was at MCAT, uh, prior GPA before being admitted, and science GPA before being admitted. And again, we, I, I'd love to, anybody that's interested in talking about the details of this, I will be happy to uh, meet up with you and talk about it, uh, less about that, about the approach. So uh, then I, I collected data, right? We went through the data as far as participation, and we had to set this up. Some of this ahead of time, we had to set up a place almost like I call it a sample port where we could draw off data to look at their actual participation and attendance in class. We had to look at their formative assessment performance or their summative assessment performance. These are our output. So I had to have some of these things lined up beforehand. So this is not completely prospective, but there were definitely some, some places we had to, to dial it in to get a proper of what they're doing. And then comes the analysis, right? And so we're thinking about, well, a lot of it's correlational. Does this lead to this or cause this? Is there a relationship there? 
But I think what this does is it gives you some really rich data to go, okay, now I can design the next study to really drill down and see if an intervention that I have is going to make a difference. So it's a constant flux. I think it's really no different than uh, education research is no different than research in other fields. It, it need not be different, in my opinion. And so, and then, you know, these are again, some more results, but just looking at all these relationships. So I, I hope that this gives you a sense of the approach. I am sorry to rush through it. I want to get to the very last slide here. Uh, not what well, is sort of a plug. So a lot of what I've done uh, is actually uh, in this book that a colleague of mine and I have coming out in July uh, and where we really want to understand what's the data, how does this data, what is this about this teaching approach? And we looked specifically at approaches that involve technology. Um, so keep your eyes out for that if you want to know the best practices, those. And then the other thing I would recommend folks is find a group of your colleagues that you can work with and that you enjoy being around. And I have been eminently uh, privileged to find this group of pharmacologists at um, actually an IMC meeting many years ago. And we have worked together. We meet every month um, and we have produced several publications. We've produced uh, two posters and two, two talks this year. So we are just, um, it's just a very vibrant. I think that there are lots of folks out there to do this. So that would be my advice is find a group of people you want to work with. And I hope I didn't go over time there. <laughs> Take any questions if there's time. Okay, that was challenging. <laughs> Very challenging. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, thank you so much, Michael, because I think the points that you bring up are thinking about um, how to look at something that's happening and ask a question about it and then turn it into really a beautiful piece of work that gets you, again, that first step. And then the next 16 steps that will come from it, which is very much like um, I also come from the lab. And so it was like, you do a study and then you'd be like, oh, well, that answered that question, but we have to answer 17 more questions. And so it Great. really is, you're just, you've got this gorgeous laboratory in front of you. Um, and why not ask good questions? Uh, and I, I think that both students and we deserve to understand if what we're doing actually works. We, I think on just intuition and, and feelings. And so let's put some numbers behind it. Absolutely. So thank you. I'm going to take a, a very quick spin through a, a clinical project um, and show you how this, again, the thought process behind this is um, there's a question we need to answer. Let's move forward. Um, so I am um, one of my roles is as the co-director of the internal medicine clerkship. And so we talk to our students all the time. So the context of the work that I'm gonna to talk to you is something that we did with internal medicine clerkship. And the key driver behind this project is that when students come into the clinical arena, they have had um, foundational science work, including ethics. And they're taught, you know, they sort of make these uh, multiple choice question choices about the best, most ethical, moral thing to do with the patients. But when they get on the wards, it's really messy. And so we had been having these seminars with our students, talking to them about sort of the ethical, moral, and social aspects of patient care. Um, and we're having these beautiful, rich discussions with students. And then Ike happened and our students got dispersed all over the state of Texas. And we had a hard time getting our institution back on its physical feet, although we continued our educational programs. And we said, we don't wanna lose this. So we changed this kind of process into a reflective essay assignment back in 2008, which we have continued to develop since then. And so since I've been the clerkship director for the last 112 years, um, I've read all of these essays as they have come in and I started seeing pattern changes. And so we sat back and said, gosh, what topics are the students really addressing when we're giving them free writing, free reflective writing? about challenges of care that are not the biomedical aspects of caring for your patient, but are other aspects of care. So we have this trove of essays and we thought, 
let's look at this because this is going to inform the curriculum. This is going to inform what we might want to do before the clerkship or even during the clerkship to help our students be the best doctors they can be. Since this is educational material um, that we were going to use for research purposes, I just always want to make a plug for this is that we did have to get IRB approval. Um, so please, if you're digging around and you say, oh, we've got this thing and we want to do this thing, always check with your IRB and make sure that you do or don't have to do that because um, that can become a huge issue. So we did all the approvals that we needed to do. And then um, we sat down with the essays. And so what we extracted from the essays were student information, which was only coded as a code number, their academic year and the term, so where in the year they were and the students um, declared gender. We, they have to start the essay with a very brief patient prompt. So this was a blah, blah, blah patient, this happened and this got me thinking about X. And I wanted to really explore this more and reflect on this in relationship to my patient. So for the patient demographics, age, gender, when stated, we have the privilege of caring for patients in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice Hospital here in Galveston. So many of our students work in um, the TDCJ hospital. So we were looking at the differences between whether it was a free world essay or an essay written about a patient in the TDC, whether the patient was inpatient or ambulatory. And then for the essay prompts, we offer what we call umbrella terms, which are listed here. Um, and you can see they're very varied. And we tell the student, use that as a, this is what really worried me, or this is what really challenged me in caring for my patient. But it's anything that would fall under this term. It doesn't have to be, you know, so, so I'll give you an example of end of life. It could be talking to a patient about advanced directives or experiencing my first death. It could be anything that dealt with end of life. It's not a very focused thing. We just gave them some kind of big umbrellas. And so in the first part of the study, what we asked is what are they writing about? And so 2,722 essays later, we can show you the distribution and this is purely quantitative. Um, and we looked at the difference between essays submitted by men and women, and we really didn't see a big difference. But what we did become interested in was the change of core themes over time. And we saw a change about 2017-18, where end of life, which had been consistently the highest topic that students were writing about, started getting replaced and caught up with um, rationing healthcare and social determinants of health. And if you think about what was going on in the world at that time, um, the social um, influences from outside may have had some impact and we continue to see this trend. So again, I'm not here to talk about the study, but I'm talking about kind of what did we learn? What did we see from just saying, hmm, I wonder what? And so we saw common themes over time with the shift in prioritization of what students were choosing to write about. There are a lot of sub-essay themes, and as Dr. Lee already said, the next six studies are lined up for us because we have a qualitative study already planned, digging much deeper. We saw that patient situations were really the key to what students were struggling with, more than managing complex biomedical processes, that really where they, their moral sort of distress is, is giving the best care. And although our early curriculum gives them some foundation, we realize that we have to be much more active during the clerkships in addressing some of these themes with our students. And so those were our takeaways from just the work that we've done to date. Again, stuff that was available to us, stuff that we got kind of interested in as we watched some things shifting. And we said, let's study it. And we've had an opportunity to share this work outside of the institution. So I will stop. That was kind of a quick last through of a kind of a clinical related example. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Wilkerson. Well, the big challenge is finding the question. And so we want to spend the next three minutes, a very limited amount of time in your domain, thinking about the opportunities you might be facing. So 
I don't know if you would like to have a piece of paper, the old fashioned concept as we do this brainstorming, or if you prefer to do it on your computer, but I'd like you to get ready to think, reflect, and write. Next slide. So I'd like for you to create as many questions as you possibly can in the next three minutes that you might want to ask as you evaluate or do a more research-oriented study of aspects of your work as an educator. And just as a reminder, when we think about levels of question, maybe you just want to know about satisfaction, or maybe you want to know if there's any evidence of learning, or can they transfer something that they saw in a video into a classroom task? Um, and what kind of long-term results as opposed to instantaneous results in terms of behavior might we expect? So with those frames in mind, all kinds of learners, all the work you do as an educator, I'm going to set my timer for a mere three minutes, and we're going to see who can come up with the most question. Is everybody ready? Get set, go. One minute to go. All right, we are done. If you would stop for a minute, number yours so you see how many you got. Um, Luann, I think you're muted. Unmute everybody and yell out the number of questions that you came to in that amount of time or write it in a number in chat 
I got five. Anybody got more than five? I see a seven. Betsy got seven. Wow. Mary Jane got 15. Whoa. I know. That's impressive. You guys are good. You're really primed already to do this. So next slide. Look back at all of those questions, whether you had only three or you got to 16 or 17. And if we were in person, I always have um, little treats for them to the most, mainly what this is about. So go back, take a look at your questions and use these little letters, C. Which one question looks the clearest? You've really, somehow it framed up quickly. Which one might be the most interesting? Which one is most significant? In other words, other people would really wanna know this. They might come look at your poster at a meeting or actually email you. And which is most feasible? So take a moment to tour your own questions. And then type your best question in the chat. And the reason we'd like you to write it down is that we can all learn and be um, stimulated by the way you're thinking about your role as an educational scholar. Um, and it also is helpful in making a commitment to pursue the next step reading in the literature, as uh, Dr. Lee suggested, and actually doing the uh, analysis that Dr. Sauter showed us. So let's see what we can turn up in the chat. Clearest, most interesting, most significant, most feasible. Is giving students outside reading of value? Okay, definitely that one would be something that would be very interesting to lots of us to know. Does PIJ's role, learning role, question educators, how to use a chalk talk. Effectiveness of third year medical students and getting occupational histories. Effectiveness of a prep course in terms of the outcomes uh, on an exam. Implementation of a GME resource program on professionalism milestones. Okay, lots of challenges. So thank you for sharing and thinking a little further. Hopefully some of these will be things you might want to carry away. We're gonna spend the next 15 minutes in breakout groups. So welcome back for those of you that have um, hung on to the, to the end. Um, I hope that you had a good breakout session and that um, you got some great ideas. Um, I'm looking at the clock. We have like three minutes. Um, I'm wondering if anyone has a 30 second um, tidbit they would like to share. Get more specific in your question. <laughs> That's what I have to do. Yeah, specificity is absolutely it. Um, yeah, you, you really need to ask the question almost down to the place where it is too simplistic and then back up from it um, when, you're, when you're sort of finding that sweet spot. Um, consultation, one of the things I heard in our group was um, sharing resources. So mm -hmm. finding people with expertise in different areas and coming together um, for um, maximal efficiency and effectiveness. And so again, I cannot, from my own life experience, um, 
stress enough how important those uh, collaborative um, uh, sort of group projects are when everybody brings something special to the table. It's kind of like we take care of patients. We bring all the people to the patient's bedside to do the best care of the patient. We should be doing that with our educational work as well. So I'll, I'll leave one other question, one other comment. I work and I think, and this is sort of a minor point out of our discussion. Uh, we, I think take into consideration founders that uh, types of studies, they're messy, talking about human beings, different intentions and things and levels of participation, knowledge, and so it, it does get messy and uh, we may come to conclusions, but I think both mentioned earlier, iterating and have your studies problems uh, after data, it's messy. Super. Let's give it back to Allison. Yes, Allison, what do you mean consults available? So anyone who has an idea or has maybe a project that they've started and they want to talk it over with um, somebody or get some advice or anything like that, um, you can email either me or Luann and we will be happy to um, meet with you or to set you up with others who might be interested in that topic as well and can help with um, talk you through the process. So and let us you, know how we can help. Yeah, put your email yes, in I the will. chat. I just yeah. left mine in there. I think you know, several of us, Dorothy said she would be happy to help. Kim said they would be happy to help. So um, I hope you found some colleagues that can help move this forward. We had originally said we do a work in progress roundtable, so you could bring it for a more focused uh, consultation and we will um, check in and see if that would be helpful for anyone a little later um, as part of this committee roundtable activity. And Dorothy gets all the credit because she made this whole roundtable concept come alive. And she's now stepping away as the co-chair of the committee and becoming secretary for SHINE. So thank you, Dorothy, for moving us into this new domain. I recall it differently, but if you want to give me the credit, by all means. Yes. I do think a lot falls on your shoulders, Luann. So. Well, thanks, thank everybody. Keep the work going. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Karen, for providing us great examples and Allison for moving us along. See you. We, we have another one coming up in the fall. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone.